Hello everybody, so today we're going to look at the bones and bony landmarks and joints <clears throat> relating to the spine and to the thorax here, to the back and the torso. So we're looking at the vertebral column and we're looking at the rib cage as well. So the first few things we're going to look at is, one, let's, let's knock out the easy bones, starting with the rib. So the rib we're just going to look at two major landmarks. Basically, we're looking at the two ends of the rib. So we have one rib on, let me get my colors here. One end of the rib is here at the, at the actual vertebrae itself. And it's right here. So the part of the rib that meets the vertebrae or the vertebral column is called the head of the rib while on the other side here the part of the rib that actually meets the costal cartilage we'll see that this is the costal cartilage in a little bit is what we call the <clears throat> costal end so where the end of the rib meets the costal cartilage we call the costal end now, with the rib out of the way, we can look at the sternum. We've looked at the sternum briefly uh, in another lecture, but let's go ahead and just review some of the major landmarks here. So first, we had a notch right up here where the base of the throat is, and we also call the throat the jugular. So this landmark here is what we call the jugular notch. We then had two notches here on the sides for the clavicles and called them the clavicular notches. The big part right here, so if we do look at the sternum, we do notice that it kind of looks like a bow tie. So here's the knot of, or excuse me, of, our regu of a regular tie. So here's the knot of the tie, and then here would be the actual dangling part of the tie. So the knot of the tie is called the manubrium. We call the knot of the tie right here the manubrium. And then we call the actual body, or the bigger part of the tie here, the body. So what connects the body and the manubrium together is this little angle right here called the sternal angle. So if you were to look at the ribs or the sternum from a side view, from a lateral view, you would see that the sternum kind of has this little drop, this little angle there as it comes down. So that's the sternal angle. Then we see that there's these little indentations all along the ribs here called the costal facets or facets or facets. So these are just little um, spaces where the costal cartilage meets the sternum. So we keep saying costal cartilage because the ribs don't, the, the bone of the rib doesn't actually touch the sternum. Cartilage actually projects off of the rib and the sternum and bridges them together. And we'll see that in a second. The last landmark of the sternum here is this little bottom appendage called the xiphoid process. So let's look at the costal cartilage here. So you can see where, so this is bone, this will be the bone, and then we have this this part here. So you can see this little section in between this little line and the actual sternum itself. So this blue area is what we call the costal cartilage. This is the costal cartilage or we call it the chondral cartilage referring to the chondriac region here. So this is the cartilage that bridges and connects the ribs to the sternum. So the bones actually don't connect to the sternum directly. They attach through this costal cartilage. And when it comes to these ribs, we have 12 pairs of ribs. So we have 24 ribs in total. But we differentiate our ribs in a certain way. So we have what we call true ribs and we have false ribs. What makes a rib true? Well, a true rib is a rib that attaches directly, obviously directly through the costal cartilage, to the sternum itself. So we have seven pairs, or in total, 14 true ribs. Keep the, uh, keep the understanding of the differentiation between either seven pairs, either pairs of ribs, or ribs in total. So we have seven pairs on 
And so seven on each side, giving us a total of 14 true ribs. And like we said, what makes a rib true? Well, we can see that the costal cartilage connects directly from the rib to the sternum itself. So that means ribs one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven are what we call true ribs. And that's ribs one through seven on both sides, giving us 14 total ribs. So now you can see that uh, ribs eight through 12 are what we call false ribs. And then when we have false ribs, we also have a subset of false ribs called floating ribs, which we'll see in a moment. So what makes a false rib? Well, the false rib is where its costal cartilage attaches to the costal cartilage of the seventh rib. You can see how this cartilage attaches to the cartilage of the rib above it, of the seventh, ver uh, seventh rib here. So ribs eight, nine, and 10 are what we call false ribs, and they attach to the costal cartilage of rib seven. Now ribs, which we would see here, ribs 11 and 12 are what we call false floating ribs because these ribs just suspend out in space and aren't connected to any other ribs. They're just connected to the spine and have muscles attaching to them. So we call those false floating ribs. Ribs number 11 and 12 are false floating ribs. So the next bones we're going to look at which is going to compose of a, a vast majority of the uh, bones that we're going to be seeing in this lecture are the vertebrae. Now most vertebrae are pretty much they all look the same. Now there's a few differences between the areas. So first let's look at the regions of the spine. So first we have four major regions of the spine. So right here we have the cervical region which is the vertebrae C1 through C7. C standing for cervical which means in the neck. Then we have the vertebrae in the rib cage. So we go from T1 to T12 which stands for T stands for thoracic. So thoracic means your rib cage. So this would be the thoracic ribs here. And then the larger curve we have or the larger vertebrae we have are right here in the lumbar region and we have L1 through L5. So we have the lumbar vertebrae and then last we have the sacrum and the coccyx. I'll switch colors, sacrum and the coccyx. So that sacrum has roughly five vertebrae. So we have S1 through S5. And then the coccyx typically has, so we acronym it CX, CX1 through typically four. So it could have three to four fused vertebrae. Now these aren't vertebrae just like the rest of the spine here. These vertebrae after infancy fuse together and actually form a one complete hard plate. But technically the sacrum is five individual vertebrae fused together and the coccyx is, coccyx is usually three or four vertebrae fused together. So these are the four major regions of the spine itself. We have the cervical vertebrae with seven vertebrae in total. We have the thoracic vertebrae with 12 in total. We have the lumbar vertebrae with five in total. We have the sacrum with a fused five vertebrae together and then a coccyx with three or four fused vertebrae together. Now to understand the shape and structure of the spine too, we would have to have a nice lateral view of the spine. So if we look at the spine from the side, we have some curvature to it. So starting from the neck, it would look like this. We have this little anterior curve and then our thoracic curve and then our lumbar curve and then our sacral curve all the way down to our coccyx. So we can see that the cervical vertebrae bow anteriorly, the thoracic vertebrae bow posteriorly, the lumbar vertebrae bow anteriorly, and then the sacrum and coccyx bow posteriorly. So we call these these bowings two different things. So we have here <clears throat> So an anterior curvature of the spine is what we call a lordotic 
curve. So a lower, lower dotted curve. Now a posterior curve is what we call a kyphotic curve. So a kyphotic curve. Now, and it would repeat here. So obviously we can see that the lumbar vertebrae are going to have a lower dotted curve. And that's where we most commonly associate lower dotted curve with is there at the lumbar vertebrae. So we have a lower dotted curve at the lumbar region of the spine and then a kyphotic curve here at the thoracic region. But of course, we also have a kyphotic curve both here at the thoracic cage and at the sacrum. We have a lower dotted curve both at the neck and both at the uh, lumbar vertebrae. So the two curves, two major curves, lordotic curve is an anterior curvature of the spine. Kyphotic curvature is a posterior curvature of the spine. So now let's go ahead and look at the individual vertebrae themselves and look at the landmarks of those vertebrae. So we're going to come to this little picture here. As we said, for the most part, most of the vertebrae have a similar shape, but there's a few differences um, amongst them. Most of the differences are going to be here in the cervical region of the spine. And so most, most of what we're going to do is pay attention to the first two vertebrae the first two cervical vertebrae right here. They have the most difference to them and some of the most importance to them. So the first cervical vertebrae, C1, is what we call the atlas. Atlas from Greek is the, the uh, Greek mythological, mythological person who holds the world on his shoulders. So atlas, the vertebrae, is holding the head, aka your world, on its shoulders. So the atlas supports your head. C2 is what we call the axis, and that's where the atlas is going to pivot and rotate and turn on. So C1 is the atlas, C2 is the axis. And so we're going to look at some vertebrae that are going to be common relatively to all vertebrae, but some specific, uh, specific details about these two vertebrae in general. So the first landmarks we're going to look at are these little wings right here. I'm going to get a little, a little darker. So these little wings right here, they come off to the side. And this is true as well for these vertebrae that well, as well down here. This is what we call a transverse process. This is a transverse process, which means transverse meaning to the side, process meaning projection. So this is a projection of the bone projecting to the side. Now the next landmark we'll look at is very easily seen right here on this. This is a lumbar vertebrae, by the way. It's usually lumbar vertebrae are very big. And you can see it a little bit right here on the uh, C1 here, or excuse me, C2. We call this the spinous process. So if you were to run the tips of your fingers down someone's back and spine, you would feel these bumps along their spine. And that's what you're feeling is the spinous process. <clears throat> now, it does have like a little bit of a nodule here on C1, but the fun fact of C1 is that it does not have a spinous process. It does not have a traditional spinous process. So that's a fun fact of C1. Also, the other fun fact of C1 is it has the widest transverse process. As you can see depicted in my picture here, these transverse processes come out much wider <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> on this vertebrae than any other vertebrae in the entire body. So C1, fun facts, has no spinous process, and 2 has the widest transverse process. The other uh, landmarks here, which are going to be pretty common to all vertebrae, are right here, what we call the facets, or facets, or facets. Now, I've heard it pronounced every single way. Don't know exactly which one is the most proper, and who, who cares? For massage therapists, it's not a verbal test anyways. So these are what we call the facets. So we have facets on both 
both sides a superior part of the vertebrae and an inferior part of the vertebrae. So you can actually see on this drawing here, you can see these little parts right here dangling off down, and you can see it right here, especially on the C2. We have facets on both sides. We have superior facets, so these highlighted here would be the superior facets, while we also have the inferior facets of these vertebrates. So the superior facets. Now the other um, landmarks that we'll see uh, is the space in between the transverse process and the spinous process. So very easily seen here on this lumbar vertebrae. We call this the lamina groove. So the lamina is the bridge between these two um, parts here. So this is the lamina groove. Now, some other uh, things to note, too, that every single vertebrae is going to have this. You can see there's a big central hole in all of these vertebrae. We call this the vert vertebral foramen. Vertebral because they're verte vertebrae, and foramen is a Greek word that means hole. So vertebral foramen is the hole in the center of the vertebrae. Now what exactly is this hole doing there? Well, our entire spinal column protects our spinal cord. So our spinal cord comes through the vertebral column, through the uh, vertebral foramen. So through each one of these holes of each vertebrae comes the spinal cord. So, we, so every single vertebrae is going to have a vertebral foramen. Now, we do have another foramen here in some vertebrae, but this is only in the cervical vertebrae. So if you see right here, there's a little hole and a little hole on C1 and C2. And now this would be true for all of the cervical vertebrae, C1 through C7. We call this the transverse foramen. So the transverse foramen is the hole in the side, in the transverse process. It's the hole in the transverse process. And a very important structure runs through this hole. We have the vertebral artery. There's a major artery that runs in between <clears throat> or through these holes in the transverse process of these vertebrae. Now another, um, so we looked at C1, right? We said it has no trans or no spinous process, and it has the widest transverse processes. Let's look at some fun facts of C2. So you see this little word right here, and it's pointing at this um, this big thumb-like projection. I call C2 the hitchhiker of the vertebral column, the hitchhiker of the body, because it has this kind of like thumb appendage that points up. It's called the dens or the odontoid process. So the dens of the cervical vertebra of the C2 here actually sticks up and it's inside the vertebral foramen of C1 and articulates with this, which is the articulating surface of the C1 vertebrae for the dens. So the dens comes up inside the vertebral foramen of C1 and articulates there to make the pivoting action of the joint there. So other fun facts of the vertebrae is that on the thoracic vertebrae, of these thoracic vertebrae, so you can kind of see from my drawing here that I have these little triangles pointing down that on the thoracic vertebrae, especially where the curvature is the greatest, the thoracic, uh, the spinous processes point downward, obviously because we don't want the spinous process to, to get hurt right so they point downward so we can lay on our backs so that's another fun fact of the spinal uh, column itself so of the vertebrae um, we also have one more landmark to look to look at so pretty much every single vertebrae except for c1 and c2 will have this big fat part right here called the body so this is the body of the vertebrae which you can see right here in the front. So this is the body of the vertebrae. You can see right here would be, um, well, you wouldn't necessarily see. The body would be kind of covered by the other landmarks, but the body of the vertebrae is right here in the front of the 
spine there. So the bodies articulate, and we'll see where the joints articulate here in a, in a moment, and are cushioned by intervertebral discs, which again we'll see here uh, in another moment. So just to recap some of the fun facts of the ver of the ver spinal column is that one, the cervical vertebrae are the only vertebrae to have the transverse foramen. And inside the transverse foramen is the vertebral artery. C1 or the atlas has no spinous process and the widest transverse process. C2 has the dens or the odontoid process, which is like the thumb-like projection that goes up and articulates with C1. Then all of the other vertebrae have, you know, all of the other characteristic components of the vertebrae, except for um, the thoracic, some of the thoracic vertebrae having a downwardly pointing spinous process. So let's go ahead and take a look at the joints here. All right, so now that we've looked at the bones and the bony landmarks here, let's go ahead and put those landmarks and those bones together and make those articulations and see what movement occurs and what those movements look like here on our little skeleton here. We got Dex here going to represent for us. So the first, we're just gonna take a top-down approach on the body here. So we're gonna start with the highest um, joint that we see here in the body, which is between the C1 that we just saw, the atlas, and the skull. So more specifically, the C1 articulates with the part of the skull called the occiput, and there's a few landmarks on there which we'll see in another lecture, but for now we'll just um, be very brief with it and give you the precursive information here. So we saw the landmarks called the superior facets, facets, or facets, whatever you want to call it, of each vertebrae. So the superior facets of C1 are articulating with what we call the condyles of the occiput, which are two little knuckle knobs that look like this, which are going to sit on those superior facets like this, and they essentially rock in place. So what movements occur here at this joint called the atlanto occipital joint. Atlanto because of the atlas, occipital because of the occiput. This is the atlanto occipital joint here. So what exactly occurs, what movements occur? Well, we can see that we have flexion and extension. Now, the movements are very minute here because most of the flexion comes from the whole complex actually flexing down. The, it's, it's, I'd have to get a little close to really see it. Flexion and extension of just the uh, atlanto-occipital joint looks like this. It's that really very subtle small knot. And when this occurs here at the skull, we call anything related to the skull capital. So this is the capital, just like Capitol Hill is the head of our government, though the capital here, the head of our body, is the capital region as well. So we call this capital flexion and extension. And it will also do lateral flexion as well. It'll do that little kind of uh, head tilt, so I get a little closer. And it's very minute degrees of movement, because most of the lateral flexion of the neck will occur when the whole complex makes the whole entire neck go left to right. So again, the atlanto-occipital joint is formed by the condyles of the occiput, which is bony landmarks of the skull, and the superior facets of the C1, or atlas. Again, the movements are capital flexion and capital extension, as well as lateral flexion in there as well. So we're gonna look at the joint between C1 and C2, but keep in mind that there's several places where these bones come together that form joints, but the main joint we're gonna look at is where the odontoid process of the C2, the dens, has the uh, C1 sit inside of it and articulates. So we call this the uh, atlantoaxial joint between the atlas and the axis, the atlanto axial joint, which is formed by that articulating surface for the dens of C1, as we saw, the little inner surface of the vertebral foramen, articulating with the odontoid process of C2. So what exactly happens here? Well, 
Axis, well, that's something something rotates around. We rotate on an axis, just like our Earth rotates on an axis. So that's exactly what's going to happen here, is rotation. So while the, the atlanto-occipital joint did the flexion and extension, the atlanto-axial joint does that rotation. So it rotates the vertebrae back and forth, which then carries the head with it too, because the atlas has to move with the head on it. So that causes that rotation to the left and to the right. So scaling down the vertebrae here, we're going to look at some vertebra, uh, lant or joints that are common to essentially every single vertebrae here. <clears throat> now, looking at the front of the vertebrae, we said that a big landmark on every vertebrae except for C1 and C2 was the body of the vertebrae, which was that big front bulbous part. So you can see the bodies of the vertebrae, especially right here in the lumbar region. So the bodies of the vertebrae. So the bodies of the vertebrae come together, but they have a structure in between that we'll take a look at. So this is the joint in between the vertebrae, and we call it the intervertebral joint. So what exactly happens at the intervertebral joint? Well, first, let's look at the structure in there. You can see on Dexter here that there is this sort of clear spongy pad in between each body of the vertebrae. We call that the intervertebral disc the intervertebral disc. This is a little disc of cartilage and other structure that sits in between the bodies of the vertebrae. And we'll see a pathological condition with those in another lecture here. <clears throat> so what movements occur? Well, it mostly acts as a shock absorber. And yes, we can have some flexion, we can have some extension, and there's some rotation, but there's really not much movement that this joint itself is meant to do. Most of the other movements occur at the other joints. So with that, let's look at the other joints here. So turning Dexter around again, we're going to see where the f uh, facets of the vertebrae come together. So we have the facet joint, or the more technical term is the zygo or zygopophyseal joint. So, a big word there, but what exactly is that? So, the zygopophyseal joint is where the, the facets come together of vertebrae. So, we have the su or inferior facets of the superior vertebrae articulating with the uh, superior facets of the inferior vertebrae. Now, let me try to clarify that again. We have a superior vertebrae, and we have the inferior vertebrae. We have the inferior facets of the superior vertebrae and the superior facets of the inferior vertebrae. And then they come together and then they form this joint, which is a gliding plane joint, which allows for flexion, extension, lateral flexion, and rotation as well. So we call this the zygopophyseal joint. So something very uh, important about this joint here um, is that there's a space, there's a little notch that you could see. If you see on decks, if we were to zoom in on decks, you can see that there's a little notch in between the facets of each vertebrae. And when they come together, they create this little opening, this little hole. And as we've already seen, the word for hole is foramen. So the foramen is made, a foramen, a hole is made by this joint here. And we call that the uh, inter vertebral foramen. This is the hole in between the vertebrae, the intervertebral foramen. And this is a very important hole because this is where the spinal nerves exit from the spinal column or exit from the spinal cord. So you can see on decks here, the little pieces of yellow coming off to the side are where are exiting through this vertebral foramen. Now, the last joint we're going, or last couple joints we're going to look at is where the um, ribs meet the costal cartilage. We call that the costal chondral joint. And then we meet where the sternum meets the vertebrae, or excuse, meets the ribs for the sternocostal joint as well. So we have a joint here, and we're not going to get into all of the craziness of what parts, just costal, cartilil, uh, costal chondral joint, and then the sternocostal joint as well. So the sterno, sternum and the ribs come together, sternocostal, the ribs and the costal cartilage, or the chondral cartilage, the costal chondral joint itself. Now, 
what happens? The only thing we're going to look at is the movements. So when the ribs lift up, that is a, we call that elevation, and that leads to inhalation. If we take a deep breath in, our ribs will lift up. And as we exhale, our ribs come down. So uh, elevation of the ribs is inhalation. Depression of the ribs is exhalation. <clears throat> and those are going to be the joints for us today. So go ahead and take notes. And then if you have any questions, feel free to ask, put it in the comment below, and I'll see you guys next time. Have a great day.